I thought my days of following uh, a fighter pilot were, uh, were gone. So I used to have a, a colleague, and he used to introduce himself before me always. And he always used to say, uh, I'm now a partner, but I used to be a fighter pilot. And I thought, what, what a horrible thing to have to follow, because uh, I'm Wayne from Leeds. Uh, and it's not quite, quite the same uh, as, uh, or, or as glamorous, especially with Top Gun out. Uh, everybody, it's great to be here. I know I'm the last person between us and drinks. Um, I know we've had a couple of Americans before me as well. I'm actually based in America now, which is why I asked for a really late slot, because for me, it's still uh, like 8 a.m. in the morning, I think. So um, hopefully I will uh, not bring uh, the room down too much. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing a drink afterwards. So um, I'm going to be uh, quick in the sense that I want to just bring the room to probably a, something that uh, we spoke about here, the world of AI. Now, we saw, I've heard AI and I've also heard automation. Um, and I, I like the, uh, the description earlier on by Aaron, which is that uh, a lot of automation basically isn't AI. That's very true, right? You've got probabilistic and deterministic um, decisions, uh, some of them done by AI, some of them being done by uh, some technologies. When I think about AI, I don't think about a thing. I generally think about a number of different capabilities, each uh, are replicating a capability of the human mind. And so when I think about AI, generally with clients, what I'm thinking about is something like this. I'm thinking about the ability to replicate communication and language, the ability to replicate what our eyes do, and the ability and, uh, to replicate what our brains are generally doing you know, when they're thinking and making decisions. More often than not, when we're thinking about AI uh, and we're thinking about the processes that we automate using AI, I'm generally thinking about those three human characteristics. The ability to look, the ability to read, interpret, and communicate, uh, and the ability to make decisions, right? If you think about those three things, that's generally what the world of work, the vast majority of the actions that we do in the world of work, they take those three human characteristics in various different forms, lump them together, and that's how we do work. So when I think about AI, that's what I think about. Um, now, obviously, obviously, AI is much greater than that, but when I'm thinking about my tips today, the things not to do when you're deploying AI, I'm generally thinking about these kind of capabilities. So uh, we've got 10, so it won't take you very long to understand how long we've got um, to go through, how many more slides. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a the kind of example, and I'm going to try and give you an, a, an actual example from a client over the last decade. Um, so hopefully that is, uh, is helpful. The first one, and the most important, uh, is if you're going to do anything with AI, you have to start with data. There is no getting away from it. And I'll give you examples of where uh, where we've tried. Uh, loads of examples, actually. Um, the first time I came across this was with a client, and they wanted to spot fraudulent passports in an anti-money laundering process. And we're like, yeah, we can do that. Um, in order to be able to automate that process, though, we need to see examples of what a fraudulent passport looks like. Oh, um, we haven't got any of those. OK, um, well, in that case, you don't have the data in order to automate this process. Um, so, and data doesn't always have to be numerical. It doesn't always have to be system generated. Data could be anything. Um, I like to call it uh, the noise that AI needs in order to, uh, uh, to highlight, to create the predictions that you need in order for AI to create value. So we have to think about data. And that's not, this is not the first time I'm going to talk about data. Um, we are in a wonderful time right now where there is so much new stuff going on, uh, not just in AI, but in technology in general. And if you have an opportunity where you think well, we are going to use AI or we want to automate something, this is a perfect opportunity for you to do research. Now, many of you may be here today because you are researching. We should not miss out on the ability to research. Don't just take the first thing that's presented to you um, and it's a real, uh, a real pain for clients because what happens is you won't do your research up front, you'll get to the end of something, and then you'll start to think about, well, should we have done this? Are we using the right tool? Is this the right business case? Uh, are we using the right partner? 
you have to do your research first because what it's going to do, it's going to give you confidence that when you get towards the end of a deployment, you know that you've dotted the I's, you've crossed the T's. Don't shortcut this aspect here because although you think you're saving time, in the long run, you're going to, you're actually going to, you're going to, it's going to make you worry more. So research, really, really important. And I've got two clients right now and they're like, ah, I kind of wish we'd done a little bit more research. Okay, and we're just about to deploy. So we're just about to deploy a couple of different AIs um, and they're basically saying, do you think we could just review this tool? Do you think we could just speak to this tool again? They've skipped on the research and what it's done is it's given them a worry when they're about to go live. Um, don't overcomplicate too soon. Another, another great one. It's, uh, I was on a call yesterday actually with, uh, with a client and they said it perfectly. We want to prove the use of this technology. So we don't want to make something really simple, but at the same time, we don't want to make something really, really complex where we trip ourselves up and we end up actually causing ourselves more pain um, because we're not successful, right? This is a journey for any organization, whether you're at the start, the middle, towards the end. It doesn't matter whether you've been doing this for you know, two months, two years, 20 years. It's still, it's still a journey, especially if you are using new tools, you're using existing tools in different ways. Um, so really you need to be thinking about proving and creating a user case that is good enough to tick many boxes without being overcomplicated enough that you spend the next six, 12 months trying to really unpick something. And again, another, another example that I've got right now, um, you know, a, a pilot, a proof of concept, something to test the water should really take a couple of months. And I've got a client that ended up using such a complex example, it's actually gonna take him six months. Now, are we necessarily gonna prove everything that they want to prove in that six months? Probably no more than if we'd have taken a simpler example. You know, one of the most difficult things to do with AI is not a pilot, but it's to take a pilot past a pilot. Like, that is gonna be one of the most important things. I think I'm actually overstepping the mark because I'm fairly certain that that's one of the other points I'll raise later. Um, square peg and round hole. Now, I, I've always been a big, big believer that um, best in breed works. I, I've always been a big believer in that. And it, and it comes from my days in customer service, actually. So I would have, um, you know, for, for anyone um, not aware, you, you kind of have loads of different technologies and capabilities in a customer service department. CRMs, IVRs, uh, there's loads of different channels, social channels, online chat, etc. And there are some big, big brands within this space. Genesis would be one uh, amongst others. And these big brands would say that they could always do everything. They could always do everything. Now the challenge is they do one thing really, really well and they do everything else okay. Whereas if you look at best in breed tools, they do probably the thing that they're really good at exceptionally well. They might not do anything else, but they do that one thing brilliantly. Now, when I think about square pegs, round holes, it's with that in mind. Just because someone says they can do something in this world of AI doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be any good. And I'll use a great example. So the market leader in a technology type called robotic process automation is UiPath. UiPath are fantastic at doing robotic process automation. They also do things like optical character recognition or intelligent document processing. Now there's an entire market around this technology. Now, can they do OCR? Yes. Are they any way a market leader in this space? Probably not. Um, will they tell you that they could do anything that you want them to do? Absolutely, that's the job, right? It's a salesperson generally that's selling the product. So they're always gonna say, yes, we can do it. So again, going back to the research thing, just because you're a market leader in one aspect and you have a capability in another, doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be a market leader in every single aspect of the work that they do. Now in this world of AI, and going back to that, that, that earlier slide, right? If you wanna be a jack of all trades in this, I mean, this is, this is a $3 trillion market, right? This is huge. There are literally thousands of vendors within this space. 
Okay? There are people whose entire R&D budget is spent on solving a small aspect of this uh, spectrum of capabilities. Unless you're a Google, an Amazon, et cetera, you do not have the R&D budget to be brilliant at all of these. You just don't. In fact, even if you're a Google, an Amazon, an IBM, et cetera, you don't necessarily have the R&D budget to compete with a tool, a capability, um, the intelligence of organizations that are solely focused on solving quite narrow problems. If you're a generalist, you're generally gonna be okay at most things fall flat on your face on others. Um, so, you know, going back to that square peg, round hole, again, thinking about your research as well. You do need to not be hoodwinked into, just because someone says they can do it, doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna do the best job for you. Um, it's always difficult to, uh, when you're using futuristic technologies, when you're using futuristic technologies to try and do the thing that's cool because it's using the latest technique it's using a really cool tool right you know they're a market leader or they are a really cool tool to work with or you know they're really cutting edge in the world of business generally we need to be quite practical why well solving the thing that's cool doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna create the business value that you need to create in order for this to be deemed as a success. And so it is quite difficult to remain practical and to ensure that the shiny object in front of you, it may be shiny and it may be cool, but it really does need to ensure that there's a practical user case that's gonna solve real life problems that when somebody questions why it's that problem, why it's that particular user case, why it's that tool, you have a practical way of explaining it. You have an ability to, you know, hand on heart say that, you know, this is the, this is the capability that we're deploying. This is the user case, and this is the real problem we're solving, and this is the downstream value that we're gonna create as a result of being practical, not just being cool. I said this wasn't the first time earlier on that we would talk about, about data. Um, and it's not just having data, but it's also ensuring that it's training data, right? The vast majority of organizations in the world right now have tons of data. Many of them have data strategies. Um, but the vast majority of data that we're capturing is not particularly useful on its own. Um, it's, it's captured because we think the right thing to do is to capture all data. We presume that capturing data is going to create value. Really, there's only a small proportion of, of, of data that we're capturing that's likely to create some value. And from a training perspective, um, we need to make sure that we uh, are not just capturing, but labeling is incredibly important as well. So I go back to the example earlier on of, uh, of the, the financial services organization automating anti-money laundering. And they had, you know, they knew how many passports they had reviewed. They knew how many they had said were good and not. Um, but they didn't label it. So they stored the passports, but they never labeled it. So what that basically meant was every single passport had to be re-reviewed and labeled in order for them to uh, create training data. Now the issue, was not that they hadn't uh, stored it, but they couldn't then access it. So they had it, um, it was stored, they couldn't access it. To be fair, they hadn't had a great data strategy up until that point, because they hadn't seen the need. They hadn't needed to access historical data, especially when they're thinking about passports. Um, I've got an another example, I'm working with a healthcare client over in the US, and you know, we, we wrote a statement of work for them. We said, look, we, you need to provide us with 500 examples of, of client medical records in order for us to train our machine learning model. And they signed paperwork saying, yeah, we'll do that. Um, and then what happened is they were like, yeah, um, we, we, we're not gonna be able to do that. Uh, we can maybe do five. It's like, okay, well, you can maybe do five but what we're going to do now is we're gonna to have to elongate that process uh, and you are gonna to have to do five, then we're gonna to have to do some reviews, then you're gonna to have to do some more, then we're gonna to have to do more reviews, elongated the process. Um, 
Now, you know, you could say, depending on the particular user case that you are, uh, you are trying to automate, that there may well be um, you know, particular issues um, with regards to the end result and the quality. There's, there's always going to be that. Um, regardless of, of what somebody tells you, you generally need hundreds of examples, uh, good examples on most things in order to get a decent response out of the back of any ML training. So training data, incredibly important. Label training data, even more so. Um, there was a couple, the, the, the previous two presentations both spoke about, they spoke about culture and about trust. Um, I kind of build this all up into change management. So often when we think about technology, we think technology is the most important thing. Actually, the thing that's really important when we think about the use of AI, when we think about the use of automation in an organization, is not the technology, it's actually the people. It's always gonna be the people. It either starts with people or it ends with people. And when you have people in place, it means you need good change management. You cannot forget to address change management. You absolutely cannot. Now, I'm a technologist, right? I, you know, I've worked in business operations my entire life. I love technology. I love the use of technology. So for me, this is not a shiny object, but it is the capability that is going to mean we either create value or we create distrust or we create misinformation or we create a, um, a, a culture, the wrong type of culture when we're trying to transform. So change management is absolutely going to be critical uh, to, to any program. And, and, and actually, if I think about the one success I had earlier on in my career, um, probably rightly or wrongly, well, it was definitely rightly, but um, I was railroaded into thinking about this. Because in my mind, I'm thinking all about the technology. And I was railroaded into thinking about change management. And in hindsight, it was absolutely the best thing to do. Um, and you know, what that enabled me to do is really start to think about the people. Um, what we need to do with the people who are being impacted. What the communications are that we need to do. How open and honest we need to be upfront about what we're doing, why we're doing. Um, and more importantly, change management doesn't have to be, it shouldn't just be a local thing. What it really needs to be is is a company-wide thing. We spoke about culture earlier on on the previous conversation. So, you know, again, thinking about and getting the right culture is incredibly important. If your culture is wrong, it doesn't really matter what you're trying to achieve with AI, with automation. You're generally going to go a lot slower. Now, it might not mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to make progress, but you could make progress a lot slower. And the other thing is. Uh, around culture and certainly in today's world, and I'll use a, a great example for a client, from a client. So they are a 120 year old organization uh, in the world of, uh, of manufacturing. And they realized quite early on that the vast majority of their workforce are reasonably senior and are very much stuck in their ways. They understood that despite the best, their best efforts, of trying to change and win hearts and minds, that the horse has already bolted. Now, it's not that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but to be fair, a lot of them don't actually care. Why? Well, you know what? I've been doing this 20 years in a certain way, and uh, I really like your fancy tool, but to be honest, I've always printed off this piece of paper, I've always highlighted it, uh, and I've always then manually entered it into a system. I don't really care that you've got this AI tool. I'm not really going to be adopting this. And so what that organization did is they said, if we can't teach an old dog new tricks, then we need to ensure that every single new employee is employed with a new mindset straight from day one. And it's an, uh, I thought it was a really innovative uh, approach because they realized that although they had tried to adjust change management, just because you try and do something as an organization doesn't necessarily mean that you can always bend the will of your people. And so I thought it was uh, a really interesting way of trying to address some of the challenges that automation and AI are going to throw up for this organization. And the final one, the one that I think is, is really important around this, is a lot of organizations, what they do is they, they're thinking about what they do now, 
And they're thinking about the world of AI and how they can change that. Thinking about the world of automation, thinking how can we automate what we do now? But they fail to realize that they're doing new things constantly. And if you don't change the mindset of the people over here, where we've got this new product, this new product line, we've got this new way of working. If you're still in the old mindset, which is people, 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 it doesn't matter how much of the work you're doing over here, you just add in more mess at the back end. And again, change management was, was you know, something that, that really helped me focus on that. Don't just concentrate over here on the stuff that you're already doing. You really need to change the mindset and the culture over here so everything new you were doing is with this new mindset. So again, not to over labor on the point, but it is incredibly important. Um, I mentioned this one before um, very briefly. The most difficult thing in the world of AI is to move from pilot to production. Uh, and, you know, this, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a data model, uh, whether it is a, uh, an intelligent document processing capability, whether it's conversational AI and, a, and an intelligent chatbot that you have, it's very easy in a pilot type environment to slap you back, to think that we've all done a very good job uh, and to, uh, in a very structured manner, show some results. It's very difficult to then move that into a world where it's in front of live customers it's being used by live customers, uh, or it's being used by the business with purpose. So those predictions that we created in an ML model in a lab is great, right? We don't have to actually use them. We don't have to trust it. You know, it's like, okay, well, you know, oh, it looks really good. We don't have to use it. It's, it's a pilot. To take something from pilot to production, to actually make it move, to make it useful, to create value, incredibly difficult step for a lot of organization. There's a lot of our technology partners that will basically say they won't even speak to a client unless they can demonstrate that they have moved things historically into production so that they know that they're not going to be in some kind of pilot purgatory with them. It's like, okay, show me examples where you've taken the step to move from experiment to usefulness. It's a really interesting point. Value creation, okay, don't ignore it. Um, it's really difficult when you start looking at data and how do you put a value to data, the use of data, really, really difficult. I, I, found, my, my, sorry, I found my career really, really easy when I thought about automation because generally the thing that I am removing is, is effort. Um, effort is really simple to calculate. How long did it take you to do before? How long does it take you to do post automation stroke AI? What's the difference? That's the value I've created. It's, it's ours, it's tangible. Now, you know, whether you realize that or not, you know, there's always a debate out there. Uh, work and the workforce are a little bit like a container. Um, you know, if, you, if you remove, uh, if you remove uh, water uh, out of that container, um, it fills up with hot air. Now that hot air might not necessarily be valuable, but that container is always full. That's what work is like in an organization. Um, so value creation, yes, very simple when you're thinking about effort, very difficult when you start to think about the value that data may present to an organization when something's working in, uh, uh, in, in production. And if I think about you know, examples, next best action. Okay, we're now predicting what the next best action is for this client. How, what's the value though? You know, uh, is it more sales? Is it that we cut repeat calls coming in? Like what, what is the value that we're creating as a result of some of these models? Really, really important. We have to think about them. It's always an easy one to brush under the carpet with data, especially during pilots. Well, you know, we don't really care about what the outcome is at the moment. We just want to prove it works. Great. But when you move to want to move to production, okay, well, it's going to cost us more. We've got infrastructure. You know, we're going to have to have maintenance. I think I've just let, let, let the bag out of the, um, let the cat out of the bag on the last one. We're going to have to think about maintenance. There's a cost associated with automation and AI that we're going to have to think about. And so, um, again, we really need to think about that um, uh, 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 holistically. And it's, you know, it's one, of the, one of the challenges around value creation, because not only do we have to create value, but that value has to be greater than the cost, cost of maintenance, cost of deployment, cost of the technology, cost of the capabilities, et cetera. 
Um, and, and often it's, you know, if we think about a TCO, a total cost of ownership, maintenance is incredibly important. Certainly one for us to think about. Uh, and, in, and in any machine learning model, you are going to have to retrain it numerous times, numerous times a year, right? Data drifts, uh, especially if we've got human in the loop, we heard about, um, was it metacognition? Have I got that one right? I heard it numerous times, it was on the screen for a while. You know, we think about, hum I think about human in the loop. It's not quite Star Wars. It's basically somebody saying, yeah, that invoice number's correct. Not quite as sexy as destroying a Death Star, uh, but it is the type of human in the loop work that we do in an office. Um, and so, again, you know, thinking about maintenance, thinking about data drift, you know, we are going to have to build that in to our total contact, uh, total cost of ownership. Um, so, I think we're about ready, right? The good news is four key takeaways. Start with data, always. Choose the right type of solution. Find opportunities that solve real problems and take at least one deployment all the way through to production. If you do those four things, then you're on the right path, right? You miss any of those, and the journey is going to be rocky at best. And that's from you know, working in this space for, a, for over a decade now and, and seeing lots of clients do one thing or, a, or another. Uh, and with that, thank you. Um, I would love to say that the drinks are uh, available and over there, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe you can confirm. Well, first of all, thank you, Wayne. Okay, uh, drinks are almost available, are almost available. Any questions from the audience? Last chance, yes, gentleman at the back. Just get a microphone, if you can just say your name and where you're from, please. Hello, my name is Robinson Lopez. I came from Peru, actually. I work in voice biometric for digital inclusion in rural areas. And uh, uh, actually, there are some like framework for machine learning operations and automation, actually, but sometimes it takes uh, also much time to learn how to use this kind of tool. So actually, in sometimes you are in the middle. So we 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 should adopt like the regular tools of, for software development, or try to learn these kind of new frameworks. Um, in in which point actually it's uh, uh, you have to to make the move to a specialized tool for for production. Uh, sorry, just so I I, I just want to recap the question to make sure I got it right. So. Um, we're talking about frameworks. Are we specifically, is a question specifically about at what point do we think we should move from production into, uh, sorry, pilot into production? And, and what frame, you know, at what point should we start adopting frameworks? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it depends. Um, I, I think my, my personal view is getting the first one into production is the hardest one. So that as soon as you get the first one in, um, You've, you've crossed a number of different barriers. You've, you've ticked off, um, you know, A, proven you can do it, B, that the technology is, uh, it, it, you know, will do what it says. You've got IT on board. You've, you've generally got, you know, senior leadership on board. You've ticked so many boxes that that clearly is the biggest hurdle to follow. I would say from a framework perspective, so, you know, and again, thinking about things more often, I would only start thinking about frameworks when you know, A, two things. You know, when you've got a, a, a further pipeline, when you've got a team in place. Because the thing is, you could, you know, you start thinking about a framework. Okay, how are we going to take, you know, how are we going to work with AI in our organization? You start thinking about a framework. If you haven't got a team in place first, who's going to adopt the framework? Who's going to be the, the guardian of the framework? Who is going to be the people, the person? who's going to be responsible for ensuring that we adhere to the framework. So I think it, ordinarily, in my view, um, pilot, production, team, framework adoption. That's kind of how I would, how, how, how I would work with a client. Um, not to say, and different clients have got you know, different levels of maturity. They may already have a data science team. Um, they may have already gone team first, then technology then pilot, then production, in which case they already have a framework that they've been delivering that pilot towards. So it really depends on, on what level of maturity they have. Uh, I'm thinking about clients that generally don't have an existing framework, don't really have an experienced team, and are generally doing a lot of this for the first time. I would say getting, produ getting into production is hard enough as it is. 
uh, then adhering to, uh, to a framework that they're unfamiliar with or have no experience with is probably, probably a step that just adds added complexity. Um, but I think it does depend. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts over a drink, what you think. Okay. You've mentioned drinks twice now. You seem to sound thirsty. <laughs> um, okay, one very quick question for me. You mentioned uh, 10 things not to do. You also highlighted four key takeaways. But if you've listed 10 things not to do, what's the one thing that people should do leaving this session? Um, pipeline. <laughs> Make sure you know what you are looking to achieve in the slightly longer term. So the, the short term, medium term and long term. Like what is your end goal here? Is it to create a single model in production? Is it to transform your business? Is it to generate revenue? Is it to automate your people, your people's activities at the moment? Like what's your end goal? What are the things that you need to do in order to get there? So, I would think the one thing you have to do really is, is think about the slightly longer term. Think about you know, what the steps are that you're gonna need to take in order to get there. And then you can start to really you know, drill it back to you know, first process, data. Um, but if you don't know what your end goal is and you can't foresee where you're going, it's very difficult to start. It's like, well, in which direction do you start? Which framework do we need to use? Which people do we need to have involved? Um, so that would probably be the, the thing I would, um, I would go with that wasn't mentioned. Of course, the important one is if you're gonna use anything in the world of machine learning and AI is data. But outside of that, I think it's you know, think beyond today to where you wanna get to and that should be your, your, kind of your, your, your starting point. Okay, right, thank you very much, Wayne.